Here we have a Bermuda Mark II circuit taken from one of the Danset record players. Uh, you have to be careful this one. This is a live chassis which employs the AC-DC type technique for the amplifier. As we've discovered before on one of the videos, you cannot apply DC to the auto transformer record deck motor and you cannot apply that to any kind of uh, isolating transformer. And as we can see here, there's an AC-DC type circuit which employs a brimester uh, resistor, dropper resistor for the voltage and that would be a proper AC-DC type amplifier as we normally see them. The actual record player of the Bermuda Mark II cannot be used on DC due to the fact that you have an auto transformer uh, which is a record deck motor. So just to clarify that, this is a lethal bit of kit and it was designed before health and safety laws came into place. Be careful, use isolating transformers on the bench when you're testing and repairing, and be careful that the chassis can go live if you plug this in wrong. Here's Phil Moss, he's gonna take you through the circuit and explain these things in further detail. Danset Bermuda Mark II. This is another um, live chassis amplifier. There's not much difference to this than to many others that I have talked about, but something to point out. On the input here, we have isolating capacitors, a 0.01 microfarad value. They are to ensure that if the chassis is on the live side of the mains, not the neutral, that one cannot touch something that is live to the mains when one touches the arm or indeed seeing there is a tape output socket that when one touches that jack connector which of course might well have a metal body that that won't be live. Through these two capacitors one would in fact get a tingle from the mains down to earth but the current would be too small to be injurious. I don't know what construction these capacitors are but if I had one of these in for service I would be looking at them carefully and if they're wax paper, I would throw them away automatically and I would replace them not only with new capacitors, but with ones that are X-rated, that is for direct connection across the mains or even with Y-rated ones that are rated for mains to earth because they meet the modern safety standards, which these capacitors, even if they're ceramic ones, won't do. Now, the other thing about this, if we go up here, there is a resistor here that we're not frankly sure from the circuit whether it's 2.2 mega ohms or 22 mega ohms. My suspicion is it's 2.2. In either case, it is high enough a value between the earth and the common rail. We often refer to this as earth. Strictly, that's being naughty as us engineers because it isn't necessarily earth, and in this case, being live chassis, it can't be. It's the common rail, I should uh, call it. So what we've got here is we've got a resistor, um, a static bleed, or I can't see where the static would come from, and across it, we've got a 1,000 PF capacitor. Again, I would check its construction with regards to safety. This is an RF bypass because one tends to find with these things that if you don't have some RF bypass to earth, then they tend to be unstable or you get a lot of strange noises which disappear with a capacitor there. So both of these components should be rated to withstand the mains, even though if the mains is correctly connected, this is connected to the neutral. Um, and indeed, if you follow that through, there is the neutral. But people tend to leave earth connections off. And they also, at the time that this was made, people were still using two pin sockets. And the other thing was that wonderful invention, the adapter that you plugged into your lighting socket in the room. And it had a side socket on that was two pins. And it had a separate switch for the light. And you left the room uh, lighting switch on all the time. Um, a particular favourite was to run a radio off something like that and particularly to have it on a small shelf poised over a bath. 
that way people used to get electrocuted when they accidentally knocked either the radio or the one bar electric fire into the bath. Um, it was terribly dangerous and of course the lighting wiring was never intended to carry that much current to run um, a one bar, never mind a two bar electric fire. But that is slightly off the point. Note that in this one they do have a double pole switch of which I approve. Um, they show their neon lamp in full with the series resistors shown within the units. The dotted lines are to show that this is a combined item. As I pointed out on some other circuits, instead of having a dropper resistor on this one, they have taken a tap off the motor at a lower voltage because this acts then as a transformer, an auto transformer, and reduces the voltage to the required voltage for the two series heaters to drive the two valves. Much nicer than wasting all that heat in a dropper resistor and more reliable because dropper resistors were known quite often to go open circuit. Um, it was one of the weaknesses of the British electrical manufacturing industry that they did tend to underrate them, particularly in television, so they used to fail. Um, apart from that, coming to the amplifier to go over quickly, typically it goes straight into the volume control from the pickup. The pickup would have been a crystal pickup. They've applied negative feedback to the bottom end of the volume control. This means you can never actually turn the volume down to nothing. Um, there will always be a little bit left. That can be annoying, but on the other hand, it does tend to stop people leaving things turned on when they thought they'd turn them off and they'd only turn the volume down. Um, into the grid of the triode half of the UCL82, no cathode bias components, which is nice and cheap, and the use of grid current biasing and hence a high value of grid leak, 3.3 mega ohms. Um, not a, any bypassing of the cathode of the UCL 82's triode. That reduces the gain and it also saves them the cost of an electrolytic capacitor at the cost of increased hum probably and also of increased noise and reduced gain. Um, 100k anode resistor, a heavily decoupled supply. 32 microfarads is very generous and there's a 12k resistor there. That capacitor doubles up decoupling the screen grid, but again, it is very generous for that purpose. 33k grid stopper, and the negative feedback taken back to the input from the um, cathode resistor here. The usual pentode tone correction capacitor across the primary of the transformer. Now here, this might confuse you if you haven't seen one of the other videos where I explain it. This is a cheap way of smoothing the HT. Okay, there is a smoothing resistor and capacitor there already, so I'm a bit surprised to see that they've added some more. Um, but basically, that little winding there acts as a choke and also it's probably the right way around that the hum that it induces into the core of the transformer is approximately equal and opposite to the current in this feed from the anode, which is hum. So you get two signals that cancel one another out. Um, it was done a lot, particularly Philips in their radios like to do this, which means that when the output transformer fails, and they did quite often, frankly, although remember I'm talking about things that are more than 50 years old, um, it is not terribly easy to replace the output transformer because you couldn't buy this kind of thing as standard. What one did is add a smoothing resistor usually or possibly a choke. The power supply is conventional, you've got a current limiting resistor in series with the uh, UY85 rectifier, 50 microfarads, again a generous value um, considering it's dr driving one quite small valve. 
On the other hand, of course, it is only half wave rectification, and I've already pointed out the resistor and the 32 mic fads. I would have thought that HT rail actually had very little hum on it after that. The remaining thing is you had the simple tone control in the normal form of a variable resistor wide as a rear stat, strictly speaking, because there's only two connections, so it's not a potentiometer. Um, in series with a capacitor which gave you a varying degree of treble cut. And there you had it, except if you fitted a stereo cartridge to this and had a separate amplifier externally, you could plug into the other channel and get stereo. And I think that's all we need to say about the Bermuda Mark II.